This is a special video preview of the Bob Thurman Podcast. Hi. Uh, uh, this, is, uh, this is Bob Thurman on um, Thanksgiving week. But this is not a Thanksgiving talk. I did a couple of those. But you know what? I want to just give a pure Dharma talk, a very essential one. And I'm giving it for the benefit of, the, of those who have become bad gurus, who have, you know, dominated people who were their disciples too much, and who are caught in the demon ghost cave. So I want to call this the demon ghost cave talk that I'm giving. And I really mean it. It's something... And I'm really excited about something I discovered thinking with a dear friend of mine, Jeff, uh, who I won't mention his name without his permission, last name, but my friend Jeff, who I was having real strong philosophical dialogues with lately about the great teachings of Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, and Zongkhapa, Buddha Palita, Chandrakirti, and Zongkhapa, about how to really become critically self aware of everything all up and down the line in the dialecticist centrist school. Of Buddhist philosophy that is the great the base school for the magnificent Buddhist tantras and which occurred for sure which was brought up from the Nagas from either the bottom of the sea or from Egypt by Nagarjuna thousands of years ago and anyway I'm so excited about it I just have to share it with you and this is for the benefit of those people who have been bad gurus and for those people who have been you know in some way disillusioned by bad gurus or harmed by them, or who may still be being harmed by them. And, and uh, okay, now in Zen there is the expression of someone can get caught in a demon ghost cave. And what they mean by that is what Nagar, same thing as Nagarjuna meant, where someone gets trapped by thinking that shunyata, zero-ness, emptiness, voidness, is something, like a relative thing, whereas actually it's the absolute nature of everything. But when you think that the absolute nature of everything is something apart from those things, then you get trapped in the demon ghost cave. And that can work theoretically very easily because it fits with our general psychotic, unenlightened state of mind of the ordinary person, which I'm sorry, but advanced uh, meditator or philosopher scholars of Buddhist thought will not mind that I say that from Buddhist point of view, Buddhist inner science point of view, the person who thinks that their real self is some absolute thing, therefore not related to their relative self, is therefore living in an unreal world. There, it's a definite, it's a root definition of psychosis, although its expression may be very, very subtle. But of course, it will lead to a kind of unremediable kind of selfishness, like so forth, what it leads to. And that the ideas, theological ideas of gods, not as relative beings, however powerful, which would be logic, could be, you know, possible, but as an absolute being that somehow creates a world without relating to it. <laughs> That's just a projection of the same psychotic idea that the absolute can be something that does things to relative things without relating to them, therefore not being a relative thing. Do you get that? That not, should not be complicated to you. That's really important to understand. Now, so people can, therefore, theoretically, will come up to ideas like voidness is absolutely somewhere else than the world. It means nirvana. And after all, Buddha taught samsara and nirvana were two different things. We want to get out of samsara and go to nirvana. So therefore, voidness is that nirvana and it's outside the world and we've got to get out there. And oh, the, the, the Mahayana talked about non-duality, but uh, what does that really mean? Does it, it just means maybe that we just have to jump out more quickly. I'm sorry. What voidness means, as unpacked in great detail by the non-dualist philosophers, both Vijnanabhadin, or idealist, you know, consciousness only, and centrist of the different types of centrist, Madhyamaka, uh, they all reject completely the dualistic idea that there could be such an absolute nirvana, that a relative being, a relative process or continuum could enter, and it would remain absolute and unrelated. Not possible. <coughs> <coughs> Therefore, sorry, I was a residue of having been ill for a couple of days. No, non-duality means that this relative is nirvana. 
is the only solution. Right now, this is nirvana. Right now, this is emptiness. That's what it means. So it means emptiness has the meaning of relativity, abs absolute relativity, if you will, which we, we means no within which means no absolute thing. And the emptiness being absolute is simply a way of saying it's a simply a way of freeing us from the psychotic delusions about all the seemingly absolute things, both inside and outside. Projections of an absolute deity that is not related to the world that he or she or it is taking care of. Projections of absolute mm, forces in nature. Projections of absolute nothingness, which is the modern version. Nihilism. All of those things are emptied in the sense of they're relativized. In the sense of that, so that, that relative, emptiness and emptiness and voidness is simply a tool an understanding, an insight to bring us fully 100% into our relativity as our inevitable condition. And then the good news, whenever we're 100% into, into our relative condition, we do experience it blissfully as nirvana. That's what Buddha assured us. Although that's, I realize, a difficult and complicated step. Because if you say that this relative is all there is, then what's different about that than materialism? Well, than scientific materialism. Well, in some ways it's close to scientific materialism, but where it differs is scientific materialism allows nothingness, you know, zero, absolute nothing, their own form of emptiness, allows that to be an absolute, so that when something is destroyed, one is, you know, mind is reduced to that, or in a way mind already is that. they even clever like that. So mind is just a, just a, an epiphenomenon of the brain. It's just something manufactured in the brain to make us think we're here when we're not really here. So they are absolutizing nothingness without realizing it. Although there's a good reason for that, as I want, in a way, it's a natural reason, and I will explain that right now. That's why I wanted to give this talk, because it's so cool. And that is this. Those gurus who think they're enlightened and therefore trap themselves in the demon ghost cave, do not do so without a reason. The reason is not just that they were given a Roshi certificate by somebody if it's Zen, not just that they are given a reincarnation certificate or pass some reincarnation test. Maybe they are reincarnation. Not to, those are not why. But they had an experience. They had an experience of completely disappearing of surrendering their sense of identity a hundred percent and having that happen in the form of a, an experience of everything disappearing and becoming like, they, they describe it as like a vast space, a great void, sort of, and they feel, and they do have a bravery to have that experience, a courage, because just before that experience, the last thing that, in, that disables one from having such an experience is a fear of being obliterated, a fear of dying, a fearing of everything is nothing, then maybe I will never have a moment of, within the nothing, of feeling I'm alive, and I really will just be nothing, so now I'm killing myself, in other words. So the fear of di death, actually, has to be overcome to have that experience, and that's a great achievement on their part. So then, but they, but then they think they're enlightened, just by the, having that happen once to them, and it's a, it's an achievement and congratulations. But doesn't make you enlightened. It gives you an experience in a way of voidness. It can be called, and it is in different texts called the experience of voidness. But it's not when we think of experience, we think of looking at that wall over there, and we know what it is—a wall. We think of looking at the book. We think of looking at. I'm experiencing the table in front of me. I'm experiencing the lovely Vajran bell on my table, which I'm just waving because they're so nice, and I'm putting them back crosswise. But what the Vajra means is compassion. So compassion is still going on, actually. And it needs more compassion to be enlightened. Just disappearing is not enough to be enlightened. Or overcoming the fear of death in one instance sort of hurling yourself into it or letting yourself go into it, in one instance, it's not enough. It could be enough if you properly prepared with your understanding and you continue properly. It could be. 
But the danger is that you feel it's a place. That disappeared state is a place that you reached. You'll go back there automatically when you die, or maybe in another meditation. But when you're back here, it doesn't, it's not with you. And the fact that you reached there once makes you enlightened and hence you be, it makes you feel righteous about being more egotistical about the people around you who may not have had that experience. And then you begin to dominate them and act, become an egomaniac. That's why it's a demon ghost cave. You've killed yourself off because in a way you're stuck in that experience of disappearance. And you think that's the real you. That's really it. <laughs> and, and you then act superior when you're in relationships rather than acting perfectly interactive, lovingly and compassionately in interrelationships, which is which you don't do by acting superior. You do by acting loving. Now, this leads to this interesting point. If you combine this with the set of teachings Buddha gave uh, in various about death and dying, which eventually are codified in the Book of the Dead in Tibet, and are codified in Indian Tantric Abhidharmic writings. I call it Esoteric Abhidharma. Uh, when the, the subtle mind is composed of three states after you're out of your five sense body, and that's, those three states are called luminance, radiance, and immanence. And luminance is like a moonlit sky, a luminous moonlit sky. And radiance is like a brilliantly shining reddish, orangish, sunlit sky. No moon and no sun, just the sky, the space, that sun and moon. And then there's imminence, with an I, imminence, which is a dark, pitch dark space. It's almost so dark, it's almost shiny dark space. And those are the three layers of the subtle mind, as you're dissolving into death, actually. And then below them is the fourth layer of what is called the super, super subtle mind, which is the mind of what is called pravasvara, clear light. Or I prefer transparency, but clear light is established. You know, because why do I prefer transparency? Because the analogy is a sky of the pre-dawn twilight, where you can see your hand, but you can't see the lines in your hand. Sort of a, a twilight light, because there's no duality at that level between dark and light, in other words. Brightness and darkness, there's no duality. The threshold is a threshold of darkness. Now, the thing about that clear light, twilight, super subtle body mind, that's the Buddha mind, that's the Buddha nature. Okay, that's nirvana. That's called the clear light of voidness. So that's the infinite energy of infinite relativity, actually, is what it is. It seems to be as if you dissolve away from volume and space and mass into it. But then you become energyless, infinite energy. That's the space that Einstein referred to as light, that they call the ether in the pre-Einstein, and he substituted light for that. And there's no mass in that space, but yet it's, ener it's infinite energy. That's what that is. And that's where we all are, really. Okay? But now here's the kicker. You never experience yourself disappearing into that. No Buddha ever did. Why? You only experience the threshold of having always been that. It's not like any, you don't carry anything from your subtle mind into that. You only know that it is there by negating that there's any absolute apart from all the relatives. And the ultimate relative is that threshold of pure darkness, of unconsciousness, of imminence. Okay, and, it's, and, the, and the courage of letting go in that darkness is, is not replaced, is not replaced by your rising in clear light or as clear light. No. That is replaced by your giving up any kind of rising. And when you give up any kind of rising, you're, you're having always been filled with clear light, infuses you without removing you from the darkness. 
or the sunlit space or the moonlit space or the whole of relativity. Because there is no such removal. Do you follow me? So what is so marvelous about this that I love is that, you know, Buddha himself always speaks to people according to what is helpful to the people, not according to what he thinks. Some people will even, at some, to, to make a point, will say he doesn't think and he doesn't need to think because he already is everything. And how, how can he be everything? You know, if you're everything, you know one thing. Maybe you'd think. But that's, that's where we get to the inexpressible. He is the clear light. But he doesn't know he's the clear light in a normal dualistic form of experience. So in a sense, he doesn't experience that he's the clear light. He just is it. That is, he's that infinite energy. So that for, And he is that as all of the relative things. And therefore, his love and compassion, which he cultivated before he was a Buddha, to an extreme degree, that love and compassion merge, is, merges completely with that knowing. It, and so that knowing is only the love and compassion. That knowing is not an experience of being a clear light separate from everything else, or higher than everything else. There's no such experience. He is the clear light as everything else indivisible from himself, all at the same height of bliss void indivisible as himself. But his love, and his love is part of that, and his love is also infinite, and the love is manifesting whatsoever is needed to help everyone who he sees as completely clear light too, figure out they are in clear light too. Because they get over their delusion that they are dissatisfied and they're isolated and they're separated and they're frightened and they're, or they're aggressive and they're going to dominate and they're going to own it all. All of the craziness of this delusion of ignorant, self-centered psychosis that I'm an absolute separate thing from all of this. So when you become an absolutely relative, unified thing with all of that as a Buddha, you are simply loving service, infinite energy of loving service to all beings. That's what you are. You are not a being separate from them who is superior to them, like a guru who is now to be worshipped as a holy and therefore gets more food, gets more fancy cars, gets women or men or whatever they want. That's being trapped in the demon ghost cave. A Buddha will never harm anyone. No, no, any, no harming of people will be taken as an excuse but that it's crazy wisdom. A Buddha might be weird with some individual person in some special circumstance, very, very rarely, if that individual needs a little jolt, if that's what they need, because they're already so advanced and so close to realizing their own oneness with the Dharmakaya, the body of reality. Dharmakaya means reality body, means all of reality is your body if you're a Buddha. Therefore, you're not a priv no one piece of that is a privileged piece of reality. The privileged piece, really, because the Buddha piece, infinite pieces, are all gassed out, bliss, void, indivisible, knowingly. Whereas the ones who are not gassed out, who are freaked out, who are fierce, angry, who are violent, who live in hell, who, they are privileged because they are missing their own reality. And they're suffering and causing others more suffering as well, inevitably. So what I love about it is, it's the final funeral of those who claim that reason is useless. You know, philosophy, reason are useless in achieving enlightenment. Not only are they useful, but enlightenment is only achieved by inference. Because it is love that gets enlightenment and goes on beyond enlightenment, in a way. Wisdom... That's how it's said. Wisdom is then used by love. The wisdoms, the five wisdoms, are used by love to build a world that's, that, that, to, to build a, a, a network that absorbs the beings who feel lost in the world and who don't know what world they're in or what they are. 
And the, the fact that this infinite energy is there from the immanence experience is a, is a matter of inference. Of it's Buddha's final reason. Since I hit nothingness and gave it all up and let myself die, gave myself away, then, but I'm still going because there is a sub, the sub reality is infinite energy that can satisfy every need in an infinite universe. Pure goodness, in other words. Pure sufficiency, pure satisfaction. Because I now am totally satisfied. When I let it all go, I became totally satisfied. <laughs> so love is right. So then love is everything. And this is not so different. Don't say this is wild eyed theism or monotheism. Because first of all, there's not no one Buddha. Everybody's a Buddha. Everybody's going to be. And in the future, since the future time is an illusion in a way, everybody already is at some time. But some have to take a longer and smaller, shorter times to get where they sort of fully feel it because of their stubborn ignorance. So it's not mono, and nobody's creating any world. Nobody ever did create any world. The ignorance puts people into feeling they're in a created world when they do, and they can only begin to free themselves within it by recognizing that it's their ignorance that's creating it. When they overcome that ignorance. So Buddha's last moment under the tree there a little bit was, remember he looked up from the twilight in the morning twilight and he saw the evening, an evening star and maybe starlight, clear light is sort of like starlight, you could maybe say. It's not a harsh light. Somehow it seems like different than dark, yeah, so it's not really like star, starlight, it's an analogy. If the stars were everything, you know, that kind of light. Okay, so, so please, you gurus who have suffered, who have actually maybe you who have confessed, who have retired, who have withdrawn, please listen carefully to this. This is what happened to you. This was a mistake that was made. If you want more detail, challenge me. I'll debate it with you to the end, to the death of us both. I will, I promise. And But realize that then this gives you a new energy. Let, let yourself dissolve under analysis, dissolve under the shame, dissolve under the rejection, dissolve under the loss of power and privilege and all of that. Let yourself go. And then you will be reborn as a great engine of service. And that's not the end, doesn't have to be the end for you. You get out of the demon ghost cave. You who are still playing the game, be warned by this. Be warned about it. The demon ghost cave makes you a demon if you stay in it too long. And you can get out of it. And you can use that, that even the experience of that, it's even to being better to the good. Like look at Milarepa. He killed 35 people by black magic. And then he became a perfect Buddha and helped so many people. Still is helping them. So never give up. Feel you have to stick it out and keep faking through it. Keep farting Chanel number five, as I like to say. <laughs> when you're a perfect guru, that's what you have to do. You have to fart Chanel number five. Try it. See, if it can, see what you can eat to do that. Om Mani Padme Hum. Hi, this is Bob Thurman. Happy Thanksgiving. We should try to be happy on this Thanksgiving as we should every day, as we should be giving thanks every day. Actually, Thanksgiving is a kind of bitter pill for me. Ever since in my teens, I learned about how the settlers and pilgrims in Massachusetts 
genocided the Indians who saved their lives on the first Thanksgiving and then proceeded to thanksgive to God for giving them the food. And that upset me in the sense that Thanksgiving has to be more than just to some being who doesn't need your thanks, actually. <laughs> the people who need your thanks are the people who help you, are the people who are around you and don't harm you, and the people who make life livable for you as we are social animals, as we are beings that live in communities. They're the ones who deserve our thanks. But we are very lucky, actually, those of us who have enough to eat, who have a warm enough house, who have a house, who have, uh, you know, a little bit of money to buy food, or have food in some way, or have grown food. In other words, all, for all of that, we, are th we should be grateful and thankful, and we should m move it toward being able to recognize that life on Earth is supposed to be fine for human beings, in, in harmony and concert with other beings, managing them for their benefit, mostly. Of course, there is some... You know, there has been some meat-eating over the many millennia, and in a way we can't automatically stop that just right away by a, by a wave of a wand. But um, we should try to stop a lot of it. It's, it's quite uh, uh, destructive, actually, that when it becomes industrial, especially. You know, the way the chickens are treated in sort of places where their beak and, 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 and claws are cut off and they are never allowed to move their whole lives, so they just get fat right away, and the, where the cows are also pinned up in that way, and it, oh, it's just terrible, you know. The industrial farming and then the way the, the manure is used badly and is not plowed back into the soil and diffused, and it's rich richness used to, to, to fertilize the fields because that's going to be, we're going to buy some from the oil company, and then their, their manure is kept in horrible pits and it pollutes all the water system. So that's really horrible and we should really stop it and we should learn to make from vegetable protein really good meat substitutes. I mean, put the actually top chefs and chemists and whoever it is on that and make stuff that tastes like steak and roast beef for those of us who have that unfortunate habit. And yet it's made of vegetable protein. That's the key. That's the absolute key. But does anybody put effort in it? Yes, in India. And India is very much more large, high percent vegetarian, actually. Cows are respected. The Muslim community doesn't go along with that, and they do provide the meat for the meat eaters. But, and there are many of them. But still, uh, and the Hindus are bad when they too much crack down on that in a violent way. That's bad. But that they should wean them off and try to make substitutes where they would happily eat something made of vegetable protein that is as delicious and as gravyish and as wonderful as any as any meat eater thinks that those things are wonderful, and uh, so that all that is true. So we should be thankful that the planet it provides all this plant protein. That the planet is perfectly arranged with all the scientists all freak out about how we have all these numbers that are exact proportion of this to that and the other that make it viable for life on Earth. We live in a kind of miracle, scientifically conjured miracle, or it's traced miracle, of balanced forces of energy of Earth, water, wind, fire, air, and everything. And we, we live in such a thing that we can thrive in that if we live sensibly. If we lived horribly and, and violently and destructively, of course, there's nothing that could be balanced enough for our violence and destruction. So that, that great Thanksgiving means being grateful and opening our eyes to the perfection of the world, actually, and how it's up to us to correct our imperfections and that the world does not need us to re-engineer it and retrain it and destroy it and wreck it the way we have been doing. That's absolutely so. We should give thanks to our scientists, actually, who, although they are currently trapped by the dogma of materialism, never to, from avoid looking into more subtle things about mind, but never mind, they are still measuring what's going on, and they're studying it, and they're analyzing it, and they're observing the causality, and they're learning to interfere in it in ways that are positive. Unfortunately, some people use their insights to use it in ways that are negative. So, but anyway, we are thankful for our scientists. We're thankful for everyone. And everyone is trying to do something, but there are a few who are so frightened 
and they're so afraid of the way things are that they only feel secure when they have like billions of dollars and when nobody can say no to them. And they're just, uh, you know, sort of narcissistic thing because they didn't get a satisfactory affection from their mother because they didn't, maybe for many lives they hadn't done that actually. And because their father was maybe too harsh with them and because their peers were bullyish to them. They become really so frightened that they become nasty and they don't care about themselves really, but they are, reward themselves with all kinds of futile efforts to satisfy themselves with surface things that don't really go deep where the real source of satisfaction is in your central nervous system, in your heart, in your in deep in your brain, you know, all the way up and down your body, you know. And they don't find that. So then they go grab other people's bodies and torture them in various ways, thinking somehow they might have more more joy in their body. Actually, the ones who have the most joy in their body, they get most aggressive with because they want to get into that other body. So it's very sad that there are people like that. And in trying to protect ourselves against them and their works, we should be thankful that we have all our own equipment where we operate from a place of joy and energy and positivity and optimism. And we go into their hell-like abodes of violence and dissatisfaction and suffering and torment. And we try to help them save themselves from themselves, actually. Which in, but it other involves also saving others from them because they project that misery of theirs outward in a very unfortunate way. They're not really evil. What they do is can be called evil and that is harmful to others. But they are not really evil themselves. They're just very frightened and frustrated and lashing out against the universe. And uh, we must be grateful anyway that they haven't succeeded over hundreds of thousands of years because if they had really succeeded we'd all be dead. There would be no life on earth already. You know, since 1945, now that's, that's like um, 70 years, 72 years, you know, we could have had nuclear war on this planet and we could be all dead. And it's actually a miracle that we haven't. And there was that phase where there was hundreds, you know, hundreds of th thousands of times over could destroy the whole planet. And should two fairly moderately intelligent people in the US and Russia decided to press all their buttons, we could have all been obliterated. And, and you know, if and they were very freaked out and frightened people and they were very violent often. And yet they didn't do that. They did not do that. And there's something therefore that we should be grateful for that we're still here. And we should not allow ourselves to be crippled by fear. That's really important for Thanksgiving. But anyway, my thanks today and Thanksgiving, what I'm especially thankful for, I'm especially thankful for Hillary Clinton. I'm sorry you liberals who think who are Bernie fiends still and you don't want to recognize the true president of the United States in this era who should have should be who was cheated out of it by various factors and one of which being that she's a woman. She's what Louis C.K. You know, the poor later uh, like struggle Louis C.K. He recommended that she's a mom and she should have been and it's so moving to read her story. I haven't finished. I am 200, page 278, but I have really enjoyed it and although I've suffered with her in it, I have very much suffered too, her frustration and uh, the fact that she didn't get to do all the really good things she was going to do, including for coal miners. She had a $30 billion plan to, to help those communities, recognizing that there was no way out of the diminished diminution of the coal industry, which there isn't. And, and also to force all the owners of the former profitable coal mines to take care of their workers now that they were going out of business instead of using legal teams, paying lawyers to go bankrupt and try to rip off their pensions and not pay them. You know, this is the terrible kind of things that they're doing. And, and, and meanwhile, Trump, who said he loved them and all of this, is, has no plan, no $30 billion for them, not one penny for them, actually, as we, as we all knew he wouldn't. He doesn't have a penny for them and he totally loves their owners and is going to help them go bankrupt and give them big tax cuts under the pretense that they're going to reopen coal mines, which they're not going to do. They're going to take that money and run. And Hillary was going to do something for them and she had a perfectly worked out plan, which is lucky, 
because someone will get to implement that plan. If she herself doesn't run again in 2020, as I almost, from reading this book, I'm almost thinking she should. She has said no, and I respect that because it was very strenuous. Because she, she over-strenuous is actually. That's one of her problems. In the, in the interim, I hope she comes up here to our Menla Mountain Retreat and she gets a nice spa treatments and learns how to relax and does some meditating about how to relax and how to let things happen and, and not over get over Girl Scout on, go, not go totally over ballistic Girl Scout on, on herself and wear herself out and make gaffes and things that then is used against her by terrible people. Anyway, but I'm so proud of her for writing the book, is what I'm saying. Showing what a great, showing what, what, a, what deceptions occurred and things that I learned that I didn't know that made me love her more and what, and what uh, chicanery was done by the, and I really am mad at NBC. I can't tell you how bad it is that the owners of the networks now, which are the same monopolistic libertarian people, they're all the same group of people that are trying to destroy the U.S. government. Trump for them was kind of a hammer. A, a flailing hammer in their hands. They knew they only had to pay him off with a tax cut and not looking into all his bad financial dealings and bankruptcies and ripping off of other people. And then he would do anything they wanted. And that's what he's doing. Wrecking everything. Destroying the government, which was something we should also be thankful for. I want to be thankful for the government, actually, because the government, of course, now and then it does stupid bureaucratic things that annoy me. But the government protects me from these mega corporations. And I also learned, not in this book actually, in another book, to my shock, that Google, do no evil Google, has signed up with this ALEC, you know, this uh, uh, you know, uh, American Legislative Executive Council, which are ruining all local state legislatures that, they, that the Koch money has funded. The oligarchy, the libertarian money has funded to take over for docile Republicans who will do their bidding and work against their people that they represent. And many, many states, I guess 30, 32 states now. And they've signed up, and Amazon too, for shame, you know, and Facebook for shame. They have signed up on those things. I'm very upset with that. I love Google originally, and I still love it, but there's something wrong there where they are helping the corporate crushing of the government and the people. There's some confusion about being a billion, 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 trillion dollar company that is making them behave like the old world type of company, which they needn't and shouldn't do, actually, to do, to, in order to do no evil. Their original reason for their blessing is the prosperity that they receive. I was truly shocked, and I'm not so shocked about Facebook, although I'm, I'm disgusted by it, but I, I was disgusted about Google and Amazon, I must say. But we should be thankful, of course I'm thankful for Google and Amazon, of course also, because they do a lot of great things, but uh, some, somewhere in the upper management, once you get up in the billions, I guess you attract people who start behaving like old billion type of people. Instead of realizing that a billions is nothing but a burden of responsibility to help billions of people. That's what it is. Billions are nothing you can eat. That you can't consume all the food you can buy with billions. You can't live in all the houses you can buy with billions. You cannot fly in all the planes you can buy with billions. You can't, you know, be nice to all the trophy wives you can buy with billions. You can't avoid spoiling all the many children you can sire with billions. Billions are there to be distributed for all creativity around the world, certainly, as a gift of generosity by you. And if it, some of that goes through taxes and a government that you can then have a big say about, go and run for it and be one of the officers. Make sure it's well spent. You know, I always thought we should have a, you know, what do they call it, um, a personal investment stimulating tax system. So that when people pay their taxes, they could give a set of percentages, be given a form that they could fill saying, I want 0% to military, I want 100% to infrastructure, or I want, you know, 50% to welfare, or whatever different people want, or, you know, you know, so they, and then they're given these options, and it's not mandatory, but when computer or supercomputer calculated, 
it can give the government a good way of planning how to spend the money. And if there's a, like a very low percent, you know, try to meet these percentages that they will get. It, uh, uh, what is it called? They're called the conciliatory or consensus oriented texting system. That would really help a lot to help people be, stop being afraid to avoid taxes. Like billionaires hate taxes. They paid 90% in the Eisenhower era, by the way, prosperity of the 50s. 90% on the top tax earners, income earners, 90%. Now they want to drop to no percent, you know, and they're the lawyers now, a lot of them do do very low percent, even below the 37% or whatever it was knocked down to by Reagan. But they could easily pay 60% and then they would still make their own foundations because they have much too much money to be able to use. And then they would be giving it away themselves when they always act like, well, we'll do much better giving away ourselves then the government will, but that's not the case. There's another option for them. They could give it in taxes, more of it, to the government, and then they could more operate the government themselves. They could get into the government. They could serve as senators. If they were, and if they were any good and had decent ideas, people would elect them. And they would respect them for both being wealthy and trying to help people. And then in the government, they serve the government. They don't go into it to destroy it, like our treasonous ones who are currently there who are only trying to destroy everything, they are committing treason against the Constitution. Their oath of office is a fake oath. It's not a genuine oath taking. Therefore, they are self impeached and they should be removed. Really, they should for shame, they should resign and eventually and the people should realize this and make sure not to vote for them. Look at their record. Someone should put out a record of what these people do and make it very publicized that is against the interests of their people they represent and what they do for the people that they represent. And then when they only do things to give huge tax cuts, for example, the present tax cut, I have to thank at least Susan Collins has said she won't vote. I will be very thankful to Jeff Flake, to Corker, and to McCain, and to any other Republican senator with a conscience who will not vote for that absolute scam, government-destroying tax cut deficit expanding tax cut. They pretend they care about people with their talk of deficit when there's a Democrat in the Congress or the White House in control. And then they immediately blow all the money on their own payment or payment to their pet industries like the military industries, building a lot of useless machines that no longer work in the modern computer age. You know, the excess number of aircraft carriers and things are silly. They can not be knocked down with underwater missiles and whatever in like two minutes in a real new computer guided thermo you know AI guided thermonuclear war there would be an end of them in no time. So they're spending so many of them instead of really getting our computer thing going better. I mean it's even stupid militarily. It's like a Maginot line sort of thing that we're doing. But okay, but as far as military, I'm thankful to the military. I thank goodness they're in there constraining the lunatic who has been let loose in there. To, as a cover for the libertarians to wreck the government. That's why they let him in. That's why the media gave him billions of dollars worth of free advertising. That's why the media attacked Hillary Clinton and constantly harped on her emails and every other thing intended to create a sense of distrust in the public about her, and not just Fox News, also NBC, ABC, CBS, all oligarchy owned, all libertarian owned, therefore, ultimately. Because libertarians are fake anarchists. They say government is get our government. Reagan was fake. Get the government off our backs. Then he usually bl blasted our deficit by building up a huge military buildup uselessly. That's not what stopped the Russians. The Russians stopped because finally a leader with some conscience got in there and decided he was tired of locking everybody up and everybody living like in penury while maintaining a threatening military posture against the world under fake notion of liberating everybody. The ultimate double speak of court were the communist leaders, dictatorship of the proletariat. Oh yes, we're liberating you and we're, do, we're giving everything to everybody what they deserve. And yet we have an absolute dictatorship and we're going to send you all to the gulag if you don't salute us every day. That's the ultimate, that's what happens at the end of libertarianism. Things get confused and chaotic and people accept such insane people. So the real way to bring on socialism or communism that the, the stupid libertarians, Hayek and Mises and these people, the real way to do that is to create anarchy. And then the people will allow for dictatorship 
Communism never was communism. It was dictatorship. It was a political way of taking over from the private billionaires who were the counts and dukes and czars and things. And then the communist officers took all that money and they acted worse than the previous ones. So middle way people who want a good government, democratic government, protecting the people against the natural tendency for, you know, corporations and self-centered individuals, narcissistic to try to, you know, be destructive, to dominate people and to extract more than they need by far. So we're grateful that I'm able to talk about this to you today and enjoying your Thanksgiving, hopefully with a with a dofu turkey and gravy. And I don't pretend that I necessarily will be only dipping into that, but hopefully that's what you will be able to do. But those of you who are able to do that, please don't despise the millions of Americans who can't help themselves by eating a turkey. They just will. And, they, and we can't stop them that easily. But only when we, we, we develop a really great substitute, which should be our task. We certainly shouldn't hate them for that, because they're brought up like that. So are, so are we. So, uh, I think that's it. And Thanksgiving is it. And I thank, the, I thank the world that we have the Dalai Lama on the planet. And that he is there. And he's still talking about democracy. And he's talking about fairness. And he's talking about love and compassion. And he's not giving up on humanity after all the genocide that his people are still suffering and the cultural genocide and the actual genocide. And uh, that he's not hating anybody. He's ready to try to help the leaders of China. He doesn't hate them. He doesn't hate the people torturing in the, in the prisons. He feels sorrier for them almost than the people being tortured because their torturing are going to live not very long because they're unhappy people. By making others in agony, they're going to be unhappy, they're going to die soon. Then they're going to have horrible experiences. Because death does not get you out of the negative things that you have done. This is a scientific fact that we haven't discovered yet in the West. But we will. We're beginning to, little by little. So, I'm very thankful that he's there and he's keeping alive very sensible Buddhist sciences, or the inner sciences. We don't even need to call them Buddhists, we just call enlightened inner sciences. And, and that he speaks up also for the enlightened outer sciences, and he just wants to help them to complement their materialism with more subtle attention to the more subtle levels of life, with, which involves the mind, you know, and deeper things, you know. And uh, so, love to all of you, and compassion to all of you, and especially poor Donald Trump, the poor, unsatisfied narcissist who feels the world doesn't appreciate him enough and wants to get a bigger tax cut for himself. <laughs> Please veto it. If you want to redeem yourself and find a moment of true happiness, veto the tax cut if they do, plan if they do pass it. Veto it. And say, this is unacceptable, robbing the poor to pay the rich. I'm rich enough. I'm not like you guys. Veto it. And the, for the first time in, the, in a year, you're going to feel really good if you do that. And let them jump on you, Mitch McConnell. Do you like Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan? you think they really like you? Do you really? Well, wait till you see how they'll react when you do that. Now, that would be something I'd be thankful for. I'm already thankful for you that you're just so... So, so much a teacher to the, to the world of how not to behave. And everyone is seeing that every day on the TV. And for that, I'm thankful. It's a strenuous, strenuous for you, I know. And you think you're getting appreciated, but you don't understand. You're getting evaluated. And eventually that will be very harsh for you. I'm sorry. Okay, hi. I'm uh, just going to talk short shortly talk to everyone about this sexual misbehavior business. And um, I, like everybody, was quite excited when Harvey Weinstein was outed. I appreciate the good qualities of Harvey Weinstein for his enthusiasm and aggressiveness. I don't really necessarily appreciate all the films he produced, but some of them I do. 
And I'm sorry that he used his power and position so abusively with women, and I'm glad he's being called to the carpet. And I'm glad lots of other people now, women are stepping up and speaking out, and I'm very glad that they are doing so, and I believe almost all of them. And uh, although there will, of course, once it becomes such a strong movement, there will doubtless be ones who will make stuff up for various self selfish reasons. That's That's probably possible. So each one has to be carefully investigated. But I basically believe them. And the ob it's obvious to everyone, and everyone knows, that there's a male chauvinist, you know, patriarchalist, dominate, dominator, dominator culture that exists in, the, in our society and on the whole planet, actually. So it's very good that America is getting around to this. It really is wonderfully good. And it should lead to the election, just to make sure that that's no longer the thing, of a female president in 2020. 2020 it would be time for right in eyesight in which we will definitely have a female president. If Hillary is is too worn, a little bit tired of it to serve us in the capacity, although she would do an excellent job, someone who she was fully behind would be someone who would win. And I don't know who that is. Elizabeth Warren would be wonderful, actually. I would really love it if she was her, I believe, if she was to undertake that tremendous burden of that campaign. And uh, Hillary would be 100% behind her. If it would be Hillary herself, I would totally support her, and I'm sure Elizabeth Warren would too. Or it may be someone completely else, you know. But it should be a woman. But okay, after having said all of that, I want to say that there are a lot of things that I feel there's the usual false equivalencies. You have Trump, who the, that woman said he didn't admit to any wrongdoing, and, uh, and uh, Al Franken did. Or whoever else she was talking about, I forget who. I guess it was Franken. And that's ridiculous. You know, they both admitted to it. Trump admitted to it. He not only admitted to it, he boasted about it. Not he didn't know he was boasting about it. It was, it was overheard in the, in the Disney tape. But he admitted to it. That is, he does that. And you locker room talk is nonsense. And there could have been a locker room quality where he pretended he does more than he dares actually to do. But that he does it, everyone has said his ex-wife said so. So that's actually assault. And that is not the same as a little horsing around. And even in the case of uh, Franken, the fact that he had a picture taken of himself doing his clowning act. Remember, he's a comedian before he became a thing. You know, he's an actor, a comedian. Shows that he didn't think it was anything other than innocent. Even though it, he now recognizes it was in very poor taste and he regrets it and he apologizes. He's, in that sense, he's apologizing for having done it. He's not admitting wrongdoing because it's not a crime what he did. It was, a, it was a, an abuse of, of authority and it was an abuse of male dominant element of the culture, such as so many people have done. So that's a false, that's a typical media and people false equivalency. Oh yeah, he should resign. And a lot of liberals are, you know, self-righteous liberals are saying that. And that's ridiculous. He should absolutely not resign. And Moore also was, is accused of assault. And well, he can table his campaign, defend himself in court against those women if he wants. And then if he clears himself, then he can run again. But he, has to, he should withdraw from the campaign, of course, because he is credibly uh, accused. And the governor of Mississippi should resign from the government of Mississippi when she says that the fact that he is accused of assault and that's that statutory rape to mess with a 14 year old, by the way, that's a, that's a much more serious crime. And it left un, un and she believes the women who said so, because she knows the guy, obviously. So she believes it. And yet she's going to vote for him. And then she's governing the state. That means she has no, no concern for justice and rule of law. That means she must be governing in some cronyistic, corrupt way herself. Because she's a Republican and she might as well stay in office even if she just shot somebody, like in the House of Cards or something, in the back room. That means she's unreliable as a governor and she should resign for moral deficiency, actually, in her case. And who knows what criminality. If she thinks it's more important for Republicans to keep winning, to keep destroying the government, than it is for people to be brought to justice. If, if he if he if he gets investigated and and he's 
he's uh, he's liberated, you know, he's judged innocent. Well, then he could run again, of course. Then then the woman's thing was not, was not credible enough in a court of law. But to say it like that is so horrendous. It's, it shows the level of corruption of thought that has happened in our country. People just can't think straight. It has nothing to do with religion or Buddhism or Democrat or Republican. They are so confused. And again, I, I blame Ronald Reagan for this. His Federal Communication Commission, immediately when he took office, you know, allowed big oligarchs to buy lots of media and newspapers and television and things under the fake excuse of cable, that there was a plurality of views on cable. So networks could say whatever they wanted, express whatever opinion they wanted without counter opinion, without fact checking. And so truth became shattered by that. And then that led to Fox News owned by Murdoch, who would not have been allowed to have so many media outlets in one market. Under the, under the proper and under fairness doctrine could never have allowed the level of lies and propaganda that are constantly paraded on Fox News, which was created by someone whose specialty and expertise was making political commercials. Roger Ailes, what more, never mind the sex part, but Roger Ailes working for people who are oligarchs and libertarians and out to crush the government allowed to parade himself as giving news. That's just irrational. And then the other networks are now bought up by the same kind of monopolies and they're behaving, doing the same practice and their final achievement was to get this guy to win a primary by giving him billions of dollars worth of free airtime as opposed to how many times did you see Jeb Bush at his rallies? How many times did you see Rubio at his rallies or Cruz? Very few, right? You saw billions of dollars worth of Donald Trump at his rallies, didn't you? On every network, not only Fox News. Everyone, including, and CNN as well. If you want to know how he won the primaries. And then, and then they excuse it that oh, he was reality TV stuff, so he makes good TV. That's only totally fake. They should have a responsibility for the truth in an election. They are, should be, susceptible. they cannot deceive people like that. That's illegal should be, was illegal. So I do blame Reagan for creating that because he was a media person and he knew the power of the media and he's unleashed this thing, dredging up the worst of America through corrupted media. And then of course, with the usual big line technique, who's the one who says they're corrupted? Donald Trump. Never mind pretending that they're corrupted in the liberal, lying by saying it's corrupted for the liberals when it's actually corrupted for him 100%. He's a total product of them. It, his presidency is a product of the media. It's squarely to blame. If he makes a nuclear war, and if, or if he causes multi-life, you heads of studios are ultimately going to be blamed. You're going to pay the price. You definitely are like Les Moonves, I think was his name, who said, I think NBC, who said, NBC slash owned by Comcast, I believe. And he said, well, it might be bad for the country, all this publicity we're giving Trump, but it's good for NBC. What does that mean? <laughs> so anyway, there's, don't, don't fall for false, false equivalencies. Louis C.K. himself, who's great, quite a good comedian, but obviously really frustrated, jerking off in front of ladies I mean, who don't even know him or like him. What a really weird scene that is. That's too weird, you know. But I don't know if jail time is appropriate unless he raped somebody. You know, but definitely shaming and all the financial loss he's suffering. This is tremendous punishment. And if he shows true, like, you know, uh, uh, um, remorse and he makes public apologies and he, and he takes therapy about what it was that made him behave in such asinine manners, then he should be allowed to be a comedian again. He should be perfect. He should be able to be okay. As long as he has it, he doesn't, shouldn't go to jail for that. For rape, he should indeed, or statutory rape or any other kind of thing like that. Then he should. Or brutal intimidation or violence. Assault, yeah, it could. But for just some sort of weird, I don't know what the laws are on exposing yourself and doing weird things. It's too weird. I'm so sorry, but it's terrible.
So f let's keep our thought clear about it. And otherwise, don't create a counter backlash like disbelieving all women if too many, if too much, if, if people make false equivalencies. But by all means, out the oppressors, out the authoritarians, out the professors who abuse their students, out the politicians who grab, out the celebrities who, as Donald Trump said, can get away with doing weird kinds of assaults and grabbings and, and, and spreading their germs mouth to mouth. Out them. Please do. And anywhere it's criminal, expose it, you know, fight back in a lawsuit. I totally support that. I'm not at all saying that. I'm just saying let's avoid false equivalencies, that they will always try to divert your attention from the real bad actors, okay? No, don't fall for it, okay? All the best. Bye. To listen to the full podcast, please visit BobThurman.com or subscribe via your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks for listening and Tashi Delek.